Bona tarda, bones tardes, bons dies, bon dia, dobar dan. Gràcies a totes i a tots. Good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for being here, participating in this third international uh, session on gender violence and health, uh, devoted this time on um, the uh, gender violence uh, specifically. And thank you so much for all our participants. Before we uh, begin this session of uh, officially. Just a few hints on some technical issues that are useful. Let me introduce myself. My name is Milanka. I'm the moderator of these sessions today. And let me tell you that this edition, we've decided to organize our Congress in a sort of hybrid uh, way. We have uh, some colleagues here today at the Catalan Women's Institute, and also we are streaming via webinar so that we can reach everyone worldwide. So hopefully, um, uh, I hope uh, we will enjoy this session. Also, you have the simultaneous interpreting option. In order to switch it on, you just need to click on the globe icon on the bottom of your screen or of your Zoom uh, screen on the right hand side so that you can either choose Spanish or English channel. And for those of you here, you have your uh, receptors. Also, let me remind you that during today's session, you can send any questions or queries, comments, anything you would like to comment by clicking on this um, icon that you will also find the Q&A icon on your Zoom um, screen. You can post any queries anytime you wish and we will try to answer to as many queries as possible. So without further ado, let me introduce the persons who will uh, present this session. Uh, first of all, Ms. Karma Gualvia, the director of, of the Catalan, sorry, Laia Sulik uh, Rouset, the general director of the Catalan Women's Institute. Also, Ms. Karma Gualvia, the director of the Catalan Agency for the Development uh, Cooperation, and Mr. Francesc Álvarez, director of Medicos Mundi Mediterránea. So, Laia, you have the floor. Thank you so much for this invitation, and I hope that you will feel like at home. Uh, here at the Catalan Women's Institute. My, intro my introduction shall be brief, but we thought that it would be interesting to uh, talk about the new feminist uh, department or uh, counseling department, so-called, um, which really believes that the government should really go for a really hard, strict and intensive way of working. Uh, as all of you know, uh, we've been working really hard on it for the last, uh, for recent years. So our Consellería has a twofold, let's say, one secretariat uh, focusing on equality policies like LGBTI, the non-discrimination office, and also the management of anti-racism, aid to refugees and anti-racism. And also the second secretariat, which is the one where I work, working on care, the organization of work shifts, and since uh, from the feminist perspective. Also the Catalan Women's Institute, where we are today, is working uh, with the goal of achieving the uh, gender perspective, the equality policies, etc., in the Catalan government, and also my direction, the one for male chauvinist eradication forms of violence. We think that this long name indicates clearly what we want to work, uh, i.e., to 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 achieve the eradication of such forms of violence throughout all sort of uh, prevention measures that we have been uh, stipulating or creating under the same umbrella. And also this framework of the human rights pro protection, our 2008 Catalan law already 
uh, stipulated that women should be protected against any form of male uh, chauvinist uh, violence. In other words, it's the right of women to live free of such forms of violence. So we gather, we uh, consider this intention of this law and together with the amendment last year, which positions or highlights this framework in a much clearer way. For example, how we can uh, define the word fem feminicide, which didn't exist on our legal framework. Also, the um, fact how we can act against these forms of violence in a much clearer way. So it somehow strengthens this legal framework. And also it includes in our current legislation clear words helping us to define methodologies like institutional violence. So in order to finish my presentation in our work plan, Indeed, we are looking for or hoping to improve our care network and also try to uh, manage for this intersectionality, this complex situation, for it to be possible to, to actually put these uh, policies into practice so that we can change the paradigm of such male violence so we can respond in a much clearer, specific, helpful way for each and single, uh, for each of these women. Under my direction, there is a resource sub-direction, but also another prevention department, because we want them to have this structural framework so that they can carry on with their specific plans regarding the media, because uh, it's it's somehow this common element uh, of this year's session. So uh, with this short introduction, the Consellería, our department, uh, began our work in May. So we're really using uh, this opportunity to introduce our work. And uh, with these words, I shall give the floor to my colleague. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laia. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to all of you. As Milanka mentioned before, I'm Francesc Alvarez, the director of Medicos Mundi. And uh, thanks to the support of the Catalan Corporation for Development Agency with Karma Gual, the her director, uh, here with us today and tomorrow with uh, Barcelona's Town Hall, who usually help us with such projects and whom we would like to express our thanks, especially for the Catalan Women's Institute for having offered uh, this, this uh, auditorium. It's a great pleasure and honor for us because these are the third edition of this international congress, which is consolidating so that next year we are already organizing the fourth edition. Previously, we've had around 400 participants coming from around 30 different countries, which I believe gives us an importance and interest that such a topic generates. And let's highlight this is a global problem. So I hope from this uh, congresses, I hope they have captured the importance and global nature of uh, male chauvinist uh, violence. The specific topic of its, each session has been defined with our partners in other countries where we've been working. The first sessions had been devoted to the attention care uh, services to victims uh, copying or learning from the Barcelona model with regards to different countries. And the second year was devoted to political uh, incidents or actions together with the administrations in different countries. And also with the uh, possibilities of war, uh, insertion by these victims, these women into the market labor. This session, we had clear in mind what the topic was gonna be we're going to be talking about the role of women portrayed uh, in, in media in general. So it's really relevant the way the, the 
gender violence cases or equality between men and women is portrayed in radio, television, etc. This is vital in order to contrib contribute to either eradicate or um, actually make the situation even grow uh, bigger. We had realized that this was a huge problem. We have been working with journalist associations from different countries in order to help to uh, streamline uh, information, good quality information that helps eradicate uh, violence and that um, supports equality. And these sessions is also allowing us to work together with a network of local journalists. And we've realized that a huge interest exists uh, with regards to this topic. And I can actually state that it's been a few decades that we've been worrying and doing research. We will understand it today, thanks to our speakers later on. And well, before I give the floor to my colleague Carmagual, I would also like to thank uh, to the ICD and the town hall, also Milanka as our organizer and coordinator of these sessions, and to every single one uh, member of the staff, Medicos Mundi in Spain, in our Barcelona office and the rest of countries in the world, together with our partners and our members. Uh, globally, uh, thanks to whom we can carry carry on with our projects. So I hope you can enjoy these sessions. I hope they're really useful and help us uh, walk a step forward to eradicate uh, such forms of violence. So Karma, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Francesc. As um, the director of the ACCD, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. We start uh, this season trying to be even more and more present. Uh, it's true that being virtual, we can actually reach a lot of people around the world, around every single corner of the planet. This is something we also need to to understand and value because the fact we can actually count on people watching us from all around the world is wonderful. Basically, I'd like to say that for us, it's this proposal, these sessions are really wonderful, especially because we can link uh, the effort and, and we can actually interweave the network of journalists, European women, the ICD, the ACCD. So with such work from our agency, we understand that these alliances are wonderful because it's the only means that we can incorporate, we can work harder so that the discourse does change so that the words have the value they should have. Actually, yesterday we had a meeting with some uh, ladies, some women who have uh, have been here, helped or, or cared for during six months. And I believe what we're going to be talking about journalism actually links with their stories. We were actually the Catalan government and a transgender uh, human rights uh, gender was telling us about her case where she was involved in a, in, in a love affair, but actually we were talking about a killing of someone. So it's it's not a feminicide. Well, it was just a matter of uh, of just a love affair. You know, we, we're, we're labeled as, well, trans people have too many partners. This message, actually being promiscuous or not, is actually on the media. And another activist, in this case from the Philippines, a lawyer, very respected, allegedly very respected, uh, lawyer, but the government is attacking, so lawyers defending activists are directly accused of being terrorists. So again, this is being said. Why? Because they're defending some other people's rights and because they're against the government and they're communists, they're terrorists. So this is a fine line that this is repeated once and over again. So the media are the great amplifier 
Well, we need to see what we're saying, how we're saying, and what sort of media we can, or resources we can actually uh, counter, we can find the counter effect. And especially social media, social media being the, the perfect amplifier for the most radical messages. So um, here in the ACCD, we've been working hard and long towards the defense of human rights and always analyzing the root, the systemic reasons causing inequalities. But sometimes we find, especially when we work as activists, we have these echoing boxes. It seems that we're only talking amongst each other, the ones that are really convinced. So we cannot breach those uh, obstacles and, and manage to find new people and, and forge new alliances, especially for those people on that side of the discourse, people with fresh ideas, willing to give value to what they're doing in order to eradicate inequalities. And in the case of gender violence, it's even more obvious. We've been working in Mozambique, for example, actually with Medicos Mundi in Maputo with women and the gender violence for us is a fundamental, it's one of the main axes of our agency for us, it's vital and actually uh, how we work our discourse and how we reach community with our incidents work, our impact work, sorry. Today's session and tomorrow's, I believe this mixture of local and global, it's brilliant how we're working locally, how the Spanish media are, are dealing with this matter, but also how this is being dealt with in Ecuador, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, or um, Mozambique. I believe it's going to be really fruitful, very interesting. I don't want to talk much longer. So I really wish these sessions are very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to the three of you for your words and such a good introduction. Now you can uh, sit down again. Thank you very much. And in your place, we will have the pleasure to welcome Alicia Reyero, our first speaker. So if you wish, Alicia, you can sit here in the middle. Is that okay? Perfect. The most important thing is that you switch on the microphone. Okay. And here you can manage your PowerPoint. Okay. I will introduce to you briefly. It's always easier. Yeah, it's fine. Perfectly fine. Just one little detail. If I run out of time, please let me know. I haven't actually checked my time. Don't worry, I'm, I'll, I'm ready to whip. Directora del Comando Señoras, colectivo formado por una veintena de mujeres, cuyas creaciones escénicas y audio, audiovisuales reconstruyen la figura de la mujer en la ficción. Trabaja aplicando las artes escénicas con diferentes colectivos en riesgo de exclusión social durante más de 15 años. Mujeres víctimas de violencia machista, prisiones, centros de menores, campos de personas en busca de refugio, personas sin techo, entre otros. Es actriz de teatro, cine y de televisión. Formadora de artes escénicas aplicadas y creadora del proyecto Reconstruir la ficción. Yo creo que bastante bien, ¿no, Alicia? Y he tenido la suerte de escucharte y la verdad que muy bien y con mucho gusto. Pues adelante con tu presentación. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. You have the floor. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Médicos Mundi and the Catalan Women's Institute. Thank you. I am so happy, so happy to be here and most especially 
because in this way I can explain what my vision is or my reading is of the world and I can explain it to the world because, uh, well, it's good that I can tell you about my reading and my take of things as an actress and also a director, as a user, so to speak, is the way I got to these reflections, these thoughts as to how the representation of women in fiction, this affects women and it actually builds us as women in reality. So how do we build the collective imaginary? How do we go about these relations that are generated on the basis of images that we receive in through the media and the language that we listen to and, and read? And I mean, this is the Leif motif, isn't it? The slogan, the topic of this seminar and how violences are generated on the basis of this uh, representation, at least this projection that is done of our identities as women, the relationships and the, the in all society. And truly, this is what I wanted to talk about today. Here I have a summary, a little script I wrote. I didn't want to go away too much uh, from the topic. So fiction, the fiction that we consume is uh, immense. There are so many channels we could talk about cinema, we could talk about television. But I decided to focus on the representation of women in advertising because I think advertising might be the, the medium that we most consume, although we don't want to, but we do. Calculations are, and I think it's staggering, but if we start thinking about it, we'll see it's right. The calculation is that every day we consume approximately 4,000 publicity inputs, 4,000. I started thinking and I thought, where, where from? How could this be? Well, I guess through social media, television, uh, different ads that you see kind of when you're driving a car and you see so many ads uh, in posters and you don't count, but that mounts up. And of course, this is actually building our imaginary, it is constructing our thought and it does so in an, a totally silent, invisible way, in a very innocent way, in inverted commas, very perverse, in fact. So without wanting to really, we start having loads of wishes and desires and very possibly those don't even belong to us, these things that we wish for that we want to have. And at the, at the same time, this generates frustration, frustration that can become um, something that is eventually a violent act. It can happen easily. There are so many acts of violence. And some are more evident than others. I'm going to go to the extreme, right? Go. I'm going to talk about feminicide, which is uh, one of um, the things I like to listen to right now in the presentation. One can talk about feminicide. We can say feminicide. Yes, it exists. It's a reality. And what is it? The fact of mothering women for the fact of being women. That is what feminicide is. And it is so legitimated, so hidden in a way that it would seem it doesn't exist. So then to get this approximate approximation of advertising and feminicide, it seems to be an atrocity, but it's not. People would call me a kind of feminazi, yes, but that's not the case. And this is why I'm talking to you and what my presentation will be about. Okay, so let me go to the images I had prepared for you. This is uh, the introduction. Yes, well, let me give you images. Apology of femicide. And I'm going to the clearest image of all, which is this, one of the most perverse mechanisms of advertising. It invades our emotional territories. And what advertising does is actually go directly to the emotional uh, domain, domain uh, to our daily lives, our needs. So is it always illegal to kill a woman? That is the question here. And this is a uh, publicity, it's advertising. So isn't it strange in my case, personally, I don't know what the ad is about. I have no idea what the publicity is about. I could imagine, but there is indeed a joke there. And at the same time, there is total apology of, semi, of femicide. There, the option is being generated of killing a woman for something that this woman has done. We don't really know what it is, 
but uh, well this woman has been placed in a position in a position of uh, well the fact that she's kind of done it without uh, well and and we are not told about the cause of the man's despair he seems to be in a a, a, a kind of you know he looks he's su supplicating asking begging so in a certain way here in this image we are legitimating we are justifying femicide what about women as objects well, this is also one of the most perverse tools of patriarchy and capitalism to make a person non-human. And this legitimates, it automatically legitimates any kind of violence against this person, that is against this woman, against women. And we're referring again to the universe of the emotional territory. It's incredible, isn't it? And I go back to the previous image, when you see a person humanized, as is the case here in this ad, yes, well, frankly, I mean, as a spectator, as a viewer, you adopt a position. And when this, the humanity is taken, is subtracted away from a person, and this is done as well with groups of migrants, and because people talk about figures and not names, so then you are legitimating violence because you have dehumanized these groups of people. And here, well, the image of the carpet is, is just, it speaks for itself. It's just as graphic as the previous image I showed you of the ad. We're talking about an object. It's a, a head trodden on by a man's foot. And the message says, it's nice to have a woman ornamenting the home. The image, well, I, I believe, I mean, all the images I'm using speak for themselves, don't they? So there are different uh, generational leaps. I mean, okay, the people say, no, publicity has changed. It's not the same. Well, frankly, not, not all that much. The first image I gave you in my presentation is of the 60s, the one of the man justifying femicide. This one in color is much more recent. I don't know what year it belongs to, but uh, in the presentation you have ads of 2020, that's last year. So that's yesterday, yeah? And I'm sure that today, as, as I speak, uh, similar contents are being generated. Once again, then, here we have it. So the harder a wife works, the cuter she looks, is what we read in this ad, yeah? As though anything a woman could aspire to is to work hard and work well in the house because it's this that will make her pretty. So, okay, this is, in, you know, that's what we want, right? To always be pretty and beautiful. So to attract our man and be a kind of, well, uh, like a wardrobe or something to put things on us, as is the case of the other image and always with a naked uh, standard body. Now, the culture of rape and erotizing abuse, as we see, this image is really very similar to the one of the carpet, isn't it? It's practically the same regarding the composition. It's very, very similar, isn't it? But this one is, well, there's a higher erotic content that they might go more unperceived. So it is uh, doubly perverse. It's more dangerous. In the previous image, uh, a woman's head was being trod on. And here we see that it's the woman's neck that's being trod on the neck and the décolletage, okay? That's got a lot of significance as well, because what they're doing, she's being trodden, so she's losing her voice. If we take into account the standard canons, she, well, the obedient woman, yes, that's being trodden, so she can't speak through her voice. She's pretty, she's well-dressed, she's got lovely makeup, beautiful hair, but she doesn't have the possibility of speaking and she's on the floor being trodden and it's also being made erotic. There's a glamour, there's beauty, as happens in these images, this um, famous ad of Dolce & Gabbana. I remember it was mm, really quite controversial. It generated a lot of discussion. And that in that way, we're also contributing, aren't we? It's yet another tool. You launch a um, publicity and advertising campaign that can generate reaction, that can generate discussion and well, moral discussion, so make it very controversial because that way 
Of course, the company makes more of a profit. And not only that, but the company has uh, also contributed to this uh, collective imaginary, because once you've seen this, you have it in your mind. I'm sorry for showing it you, but once you've seen it, it stays in you. And that's the aim of my presentation. I mean, as I said, it's my interpretation. Yes, my, my take on things. But I think it's very necessary and very healthy as well, yeah, that we understand what the stimuli are that we receive every day so that we can unravel the whole thing and understand why we reproduce certain patterns, why we assume certain roles. We have to know where we come from. When we talk and, you know, we, we kind of, we aghast at the proliferation of these horrible groups of males raping. I mean, in Spain, we have the term manada. Yes, it's a, a journalistic term referring, when we say manada in Spanish, we know that we, we're talking of a pack of men, literally, like a pack of wolves. And they say the pack of Manresa, the pack of whatever town, it exists. There is a specific terminology to talk about well, uh, something that's shocking, atrocious. I don't know how to call it, but we know exactly what we're referring to when we talk about a pack, yes? And we know it, why? Because we have consumed it and we consume it still in different presentations, in different times. And we have been inheriting all this regularly and constantly. So, yes, we've been inheriting all this. I laughed, well, not to cry, really. I mean, laughter, as we know, is a way to hide shame. And this is what I feel right now by sharing these images with you and, and talking about these images. The perfect plan, it says in Spanish, the perfect plan. Talking exactly what we all know, all women, I mean, when we talk about a pack, yes, of men, we know exactly what's going to happen. The perfect plan, group rape. And this is legal, beware. This is legal advertising, yes? A man, I mean, why should I even explain it to you? I mean, the, the images speak for themselves, don't they? So it's a woman with five glasses of alcohol is perfectly rapeable, so to speak. She can be raped easily. This is another very legal and profitable type of advertising is to show a hamburger, a hot dog type as a penis. Or a tunnel like uh, women that can be penetrated. This is actually the deodorant advertising. Well. So since when did anybody care whether you're beautiful inside is what it says in this ad with the woman and this the using this to refer to her car. So, of course, here there's a double entendre, isn't there? I mean, and they're using a pretty well-known person, right? And this is the sentence. Since when did anybody care whether you're beautiful inside? I mean, it's what I was telling you. It is just making women an object. So when you dehumanize someone, you are legitimating any kind of abuse. And the same thing here on the right, it's an ad for a TV when for the world, the football, the soccer World Cup. You have two women and it's a game, one of them racialized, by the way. Yes. And with, uh, you know, uh, those, uh, well, one of them with a Brazil T-shirt and pretty exuberant. Yes. And here there is a game. Well, they're playing with words and they're referring to the frontal part that is, well, also um, the Brazilian woman idea, but it says, the sentence says, you'll see the best frontals of the world. And it's, it's a game of words, meaning you're going to be seeing their breasts. Then another thing that we see a lot, the culture of diet. So this highlights the fact that being slim is one of our main aims as women, one of our vital goals. And furthermore, I think there's also a double interpretation here because, uh, well, to be slim has to do as well with the space that we occupy as women, yeah? The space that we take up. 
And I think there's a double message here. We are not allowed to take up more of the space that is allotted to us. We could go on for a long time. I could give you more, but simplifying, this is what it is. It's not, you know, being slim is not only being slim to be pretty. It's also not to take up more space than we should as women. So also there's this obsession about being fat in, in advertising in general, but there's also this prohibition as women in the fact that we are not allowed to be fat. We are not allowed to take up space. Yet another one of the capitalist tools uh, is this. Yes, come on, use this, you see, keep up with the house uh, while you keep down your weight. Another perfect plan if you are a woman. So yes, use your time well and you can be a good housewife and clean the home. And so then obey the dictate of being slim while you do all this, all these house chores. Then this image includes many, many simultaneous forms of violence. One of them is the one I'm going to talk about. It hadn't been mentioned yet, is showing women also as rivals in fighting each other. Because of course, if you divide the enemy, you will conquer, right? So what do we read in Spanish? The woman that doesn't take care of her banana will lose the banana to another woman who will eat it, literally. If I remember correctly, this was an ad, I don't know whether it was for some place where they, a party hall or something like that. I don't really understand what the aim is behind this message, but frankly, I do understand that there is a banana that of course um, is a phallic form. So there's a text very clearly uh, positioning uh, the situation. And there is this look of ambition. Oh, I don't know, it's, it's many things. It's a lust together with consumerism. And now this image I said, 2020, this is from last year. It also has to do with consumerism. Very typical as well, both in fiction and in advertising to associate women with um, maximum consumerism. Yes, women uh, all want to have money to spend. Yeah. Women want to use men to be able to buy all those um, things. Um, and this goes back to that first uh, sentence asking, it should be legal, yeah, to kill a woman in the sense women want to take advantage just to have the things they want as great um, consumerism. And this is um, a publicity campaign of a shopping center. And the sentence is here, my, my wife and my son are happy while my wallet suffers. In any case, it's always good to be here. This is taken as a, as a, as a kind of real comment of someone going to the shopping mall. And this ad then is feeding this image of women as um, that love consumerism, women who are happy just buying clothes and having things, having possessions. Then the result, the performance, this image, well, I see so many things in this image. This is also an advertising campaign that was pretty controversial in Carrefour in Argentina, I believe. Yes, in Carrefour, the supermarkets, and this is a 2020 campaign. And let me tell you, it means that right from being kids, we are being programmed because there are so many messages being addressed. Uh, it's incredible. I mean, on the left, it's kind of for boys becoming champions uh, on the left and on the right in pink, girls becoming cooks, literally. So here you see it. I mean, with the boy, it says, yes, champion, a sea of champion. Yes, and it's uh, boys, you see this car, it's well, a motorbike. Anyway, something that has to do with races, champion. And then on the right, you see in pink with a sea of cook, not champion, right? And also pink, it all perpetuates the stereotype. And this really mm, evoked in me a sentence that really it summarizes everything that took me to start my project of reconstructing, reconstructing fiction, which is you can be what you can, you can't be what you can't see. Okay. 
And this is a sentence that they repeated a lot in a documentary film I recommend, which is Misrepresentation, excellent documentary. And in, in this documentary, they talk precisely about the space of women in, in spaces of power. In, in different worlds, in universities, the world of politics, you know, where the kind of direction of the world takes place. So we as women cannot be something that we have not seen. We cannot project ourselves onto something we have not seen. And if we see ourselves as cooks, well, we project ourselves as cooks. If we see ourselves as princesses, we project ourselves as princesses. And we tend to, well, project as women lying on the floor with a foot crushing our head. If we see this all the time, we eventually make this image romantic. So there's a kind of legitimation of this. It comes to us through all different channels everywhere, and we see it all the time. Where is this leading to? Well, everything is being is becoming very precarious. If we have less access to power, then if we live with this famous syndrome of being imposters, yeah, and when we reach a place uh, from which we can talk publicly and where we can have a discourse that has been created, well, we always feel guilty as women, because it's very difficult for us to legitimate and justify this space and this power for ourselves if we are not used to it, if we've never seen it, if we've never had it before. There's a whole fight here and there's a huge work to be done. I mean, um, very often therapeutic, yes, but it's, one has to invest a lot of effort to be able to reach the spaces of power and this um, precariousness uh, in, in women leads towards, uh, well, more women poverty, more women dependency, and more being submissive as women. So what can we do? This I, I would like, well, I would like this to be the end of my presentation. What can we do? We should do away with the role of being victims from our imaginary. We should really eliminate that. It's essential to analyze where we come from as women, to get to know the past, analyze the present, and transform the present for the future. Yes, we have to transform the present, transform what we have through images, through words, words, images that we generate construct our thought, they construct our imaginary. So we urgently, urgently need different narratives, different narratives of women from different social contexts, women from different uh, ethnic groups, from different situations, different, different works uh, in life. We need also narratives of different masculinities. We need different narratives, full stop different people that don't feel identified either with the, this binary gender system. We just need diversity of relationships, of thoughts, diversity of references. And giving visibility and also we must strengthen and empower these narratives. We have to build imaginaries. And well, this is all I wanted to finish with this. I mean, most especially highlight the fact that the content, everything, everything we share is important. I have, a, well, a, a slogan and I have had it for quite a few years. I refuse to share images in which we as women are vexed, humiliated, in which um, uh, there is still the generation of this, of this, what to call it. It's a term I've used plenty, but I use it again. I have to. I mean, it does represent what I want to convey, which is legitimizing, justifying violence. Yes, so I refuse to, to share this. What we share exists. So that's why we have to be careful. And there's a clear positioning, isn't there? One has to say as a woman, no, I want to stop sharing this. I'm only going to share what builds, not what destroys. That's all. I finish here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia, for your intervention. Um, 
you mentioned beforehand that you couldn't stay until the end of the sessions for some family reasons. So at the end of our debate, in her case, we will do right now Alicia's Q&A. When I talked to you, I remembered that we were preparing this intervention. I was trying to convince you to come and we were talking uh, about um, our context and I remember that there's a huge uh, lot of things we need to do, even the famous song, uh, the, the one I want to be dreamt or not even dreamt, um, this famous song and, and it has a clear message, you know, the publicity, all the impu input all around, all of us, um, you know, the, we keep being bombarded with this uh, information. Mark from Barcelona says it's clear that the, that the role, the image of the women has always been used in publicity. We just need to watch any car ads. We have a scientific research uh, saying that up to, is there any scientific report justifying up to which extent this has uh, a clear influence? I don't know. I don't really know. My part of the research has been to actually share this message, this idea with other women. And I've actually seen clearly enough that, yes, uh, we have noted that such forms of behavior have created from our past references, not only in uh, publicity, but also TV series, etc. Exactly, because of this uh, romantic idea of the whole thing, it's part of our imaginary. For example, I remember one of the last comments that come to my mind this week. For example, I started a new creation uh, gig with diverse colleagues. What I mean diverse, I mean from different social contexts, pro professions, age, etc. And one of the elements, ideas that we shared was that we have cried trying some clothing items in any store, you know, and a male colleague actually just looked staring at us, you know, flabbergasted saying, I would have never imagined crying, trying some clothes on. I don't really know if this is a scientific example, but it happens. It does happen. It's a reality. Yes, we do encourage people to actually do a scientific research. Alicia would like to comment something. This, the, the ad auto-regulation is a social responsibility commitment that should respect some deontologic uh, laws and, and principles. We have not really advanced much, even though the existence of this auto-self-regulation uh, exactly, it's obvious. It's true that we have not advanced much. Any of you here uh, today in the room would like to pose any question for uh, to Alicia? Okay, Frances, I'll give him the mic. We've seen in your presentation a few examples of ads from different decades uh, of the 20th or 21st century. Do you reckon that we have advanced? Have we seen any sort of improvement in the sense that the representation of women is less and less uh, humiliating or or is it not the case? Well, I believe, yes, we are advancing. That's that's clearly the case. But at the moment, I believe that, well, nobody would dare, and I say dare because maybe the intention, the actual desire would be there, but I believe no one would actually dare to film a publicity ad 
as, as clear as the first one, the one of the 60s. Is it illegal to kill a woman? And I say I believe because I'm not really 100% sure uh, because they wouldn't dare probably for the sort of repercussion that it could have. But I believe that someone would actually consider the possibility. Yes, we have advanced, it's true. I can't actually remember right now, but in order to select these items, it's been really hard because there are so many, it's unbelievable. So I just took my peek and afterwards I could tidy up a little bit my ideas and I thought they do represent the basic uh, streamline of, of ideas I wanted to talk, to talk about. If I can't recall properly, in the 60s there was also an example of an ad where you could see a man coming back home and actually battering, uh, hitting and harassing, humiliating his wife because his brandy was not ready. And this happened uh, 40 years ago. My mom and dad actually were consumers of, of this. It's a whole generation we're talking about. We're here, they're still alive. So I believe that the active responsibility of cutting that vital line, that, that fact, it's vital because we are inheriting, we are coming directly from, from that moment. So we need to say, stop, that's it. Let's transform the messages we are um, stream, streaming. Or There is obviously a commercial interest to assume, to accept such petitions. I'll be clear with you. This is my opinion. It's a way of being politically correct. What can actually reach an interest the most and can uh, awaken our emotional universe? For example, a racialized element or individuals, a Chinese woman, a black woman, okay, the quota's ready, let's go. And we're maybe advertising a product that is actually promoting slavery in, in half of, of the world. So, well, have we advanced? Maybe we've washed that, we've clean washed that first stage or that side of the coin, but not the other. Recently also, I remember a friend of mine who's a film director and also uh, marketing expert, she published in one of her Instagram stories some conversations she had actually heard in some of her marketers, marketing or agency, publicity agencies, um, uh, conversations. The criteria choosing an actress or an actor, it's absolutely horrendous what's being talked. At the end of the day, I really hope there's an attitude of change because I believe, yeah, there's people working towards this change, but still there is just a simple quick face washing, just, just out of interest. It's not genuine. We have some comments from Maria Cobos saying that regarding uh, humiliating publicity, at least some uh, some uh, examples like Versace's have been banned. Or another one uh, from El Corte Inglés, social pressure and denounce are vitals. Marketing agencies will think, will rethink if they uh, publicize any examples of harassment. Obviously, they could be denounced. And Maria Jose Franco Moreno also tells us about her story. A few years ago, the path towards a university, I actually changed the road I took because I had to watch a lot of uh, clothing ad example that were actually affecting my self-esteem. 
because uh, we're not really conscious, but it really does affect us. Now I only watch content that it's worthwhile and doesn't affect me. Thank you so much for sharing your, your um, example. Marianne Gutierrez, uh, this is the last one. Yes, there are still ads. Uh, doing uh, some homage of feminicide uh, examples of uh, humiliation or etc these last 10 years we have not really advanced we are more subtle now yes this is one of the topics up to what extent we had a comment by noe up to what extent women are also participants or they accept or they don't denounce we are following these skinny ladies i'm not uh, being uh, disrespectful to anyone, but especially the skinny young girls, the ones, uh, you know, appearing in perfume ads or lingerie, etc. Well, um, Creo que, que es importante, ¿dónde ponemos el foco? Uh, the idea is where do we need to focus, you know? Uh, it's really complex and it's quite broad, you know? How could I say it? Sorry, I'm going to use this disrespectful term, uh, the skinny, the skinny girl, because it's been normalized. It's part of our imaginary. When we talk about women who do not correspond to this X standard normalized canon, we need to, how could I say it briefly? Again, we need to be an obstacle for each other again. We compare each other again, like your body is more le legitimized or legal than mine. Well, every single woman's body is wonderful and they allow us to do what we do. So I believe this, is, this should be our starting point. Yes, of course. How do we avoid making this this message ongoing ever and ever again the the pat the patriarchy says you can access power if you have such a body if you have this lifestyle if you're wearing such clothes you might be able to access power because you respond to that uh, stereotype that the system accepts so you might have some social economic political privileges whatever but if you disobey you're portraying the clear message you're against you're a squatter you are against the system so you're labeled you know of course we are consuming and then again all this fast fashion and the false illusion that if you have more, you are richer or you have more clothes or you have more items of clothing to wear, to change your status, you are more powerful. It's a double-sided uh, speed. Any more questions? Yeah, okay. Well, first of all, I congratulate you because this was one of the main goals that we were uh, actually willing to deal with, uh, to actually get out from this sort of technical vision of violence. Your presentation has showed us what our day-to-day -day life looks like, what sort of products are we consuming as, as users, and secondly, because even though during the session we will try to talk about how well the media is working these days uh, to talk about violence, the truth is that the background and one of the key issues is publicity, what's uh, actually uh, financing the media, they're still very aggressive, so well done. My question deals with how can we conjugate or mix these two streams or sides on the one hand the art and on the other your 
exhibition, your your words on where can we draw and set these limits in publicity, in advertising. Well, there are some organizations and institutions trying to control and filter uh, content out of violence. And, and we've realized that this is not the case. But again, uh, the freedom of expression and the artistic uh, creation you being part of the sector, how do you live? How do you accept it? How do you feel about it? I feel really, really badly because every time when we have any examples of demand of a song, a scene, a film, or an ad, sometimes creators defend themselves saying, well, you know, I'm shielding my position because this was an example of uh, freedom of creativity where can we set the limits well i wish i had the, the answer to your query i'll answer with another example the other day also in this new piece that we are creating when we submerge uh, everything around what we do is dealing with our new show and with a male colleague we were talking about why? Why do we do stuff? Why do we do things? For me, it's basic to ask yourself why. I believe it should be part of the ABC of every single creator. Why are you preparing this or that show? My personal interest is clearly to transform things. I mean, as a creator, as an artistic person, I want to give voice to people whose voices are not being heard. I want to talk about repression. It, it touches me. It moves me. I cannot understand what the purpose is, for example, of uh, Fetangana the other day with the, the, the main photograph. I don't know which uh, photo I'm talking about. It's this guy surrounded by loads of influencers, actresses, designers, with a position where he's in the middle and all around, all the girls are wearing a bikini in a yacht, parting. A very similar uh, example of the the naked lady being being an object you know being being a piece of a shelf with the handbags and shoes i can't understand it i will never ever defend such attitudes i cannot believe these can be defended as a freedom of creativity this promotes this violent this possessive imaginary this classist imaginary again I do not defend it at all. So what can we do about it? Well, first of all, take on responsibility. And we should be humble with regard to what we can do with my work. I decide to focus it towards this or that direction. If this speech today can be used to, for us to reflect on what's going on and what my if my creation, my show helps people rethink their lives, then I'm really, really happy. Everyone is responsible for their thoughts and their work. Thank you so much, Alicia. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, I know that you need to go. My child is ill, yeah. It's hard combining work and family life. We know that. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to uh, have you here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Con la siguiente participante.
que mientras se instale, pues yo quizás la pueda The next speaker, I'm going to introduce her, and we're talking about Inma Sanchez. She's a journalist, a writer, creator, and author of La Contra of uh, the interviews in the Vanguardia newspaper. And she's also, well, it's been a section of the newspaper that's very famous. It's received many awards and she's been interviewing many famous people all over the place. And she says, if you can't give hope, it's not worth our while to write. Before that, she was a um, reporter all over the world and covering social issues, especially. She's been a teacher at the International Catalan University. And for two seasons, she's had an interview program in the Catalan radio, Rag U channel. And in the copy, she's published a number of books and uh, stories. And she was selected as one of the top 100 women leaders in Spain 2018. Welcome, welcome, Ima, you have the floor. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure to be here. Gender violence and media. Well. There are things that we don't need to repeat. We all know that violence against women from men, it's something that is part of our society at all levels. It's just the way it is. Even at the government level, who should be protecting each and single one of their citizens, there is some sort of breach. I'm not uh, um, saying that people are guilty or not, but we see that, well, women don't enjoy the same salaries. There's this sort of bias that uh, impedes that women, not only in this so-called first world, but all around the world, women are treated uh, not like human beings. I'm not kidding. I imagine you are well informed but in this first world where we live, the difference is just brutal because uh, little girls in India are being forced to get married uh, at age nine in other places are even sold. I remember once I interviewed a Narab woman who said, I saw, I was impressed. I saw how my mom, as she was having a baby, if she had a baby girl, she actually stroked and killed that baby girl. So these are things that go far, far beyond. Jair Bolsonaro in this first world, Cristina Lam in her piece, Our Bodies, Their Battles, legally chosen president of Brazil in 2018, two days ago, said to a female politician at the Congress, he said that she was too ugly to be raped. And he's still there. Isn't that shocking? He should not be still. Trump, he actually managed that 53% of the female, white female vote was for him, even though his misogyny, he's grabbed them by her cunt or their cunt. No. In the Islamic State, they're being sold as if they were uh, motorbikes in a 100% legal way. We have legal registered documents of sales of women signed by a judge and a witness. The product, the woman is described as 20 years old, green, brown eyes, thin uh, height, one meter 30, like two cylinders, like a motorbike. Long long time ago, I interviewed a Northern European minister being more advanced. We imagine, I believe she came from Norway in such countries that seem to be more civic. It's false, she admitted, because when we start having children, 
the ones who need to do a half shift are us women. So no, it's it's the same all around the world. And this politician told me something that you might think it's it might be silly, but it made me think about, she said, who do you think that cares about women's cause and the women battle? He said, well, society. No, no, I'm going to ask the same again. Who do you think the black uh, cause, uh, who's worrying for, for black men to be, well, black, obviously. Women, only women care about women's situation. Why? Of course. I'm not talking about the fact men being bad. No, I'm just saying that our system is directed and organized by men. It's the patriarchy. Men are comfortable. We cannot deny it. They decide, they write stories, and it's a story without women. We are not there. Why? Because it's always been like this, and well, few people actually thinks or rethinks about the status quo. Let's see, who can name five top economists, five female economists, or five physicians, or physicists, or five uh, current painters? I can't even name them. And I've been, uh, for 23 years, I've been doing interviews, five Nobel Prizes. I've actually interviewed some astrophysicists and, and some other chemists, five chefs, when we were supposed to spend all our life in the kitchen. Was it not our corner? Not even, that's not even the case. So what's going on? What is happening? We're totally useless. What's the matter here? Because you guys see there is a problem. It's an issue of valuing, of recognizing. As I said, I have been doing interviews for 23 years in La Contra. There are thousands of women. I've met amazing women and with that added difficulty of being women, for example, in every single science, not one of them has not told me, it's been really, really hard. My memory is actually terrible, but I remember a physicist who told me in my classroom, everyone were men, I believe she must be around her 60s. And she told me when I was a student, we had some workshops and with my working group, as I was the only girl, of course, I had to work with three other students. I remember telling them what my conclusions were. And when I turned around, they, they had gone. So it's really, really hard to battle in such a men's world. But there are amazing women around who actually achieve incredible things. As a journalist, I want them to be known. I want them to, to be applauded because victimism is uh, actually useless. So what can we do? I wouldn't say fight, but we need to carry on, continue, debate, recognize. This is what we need to do. For a start, for example, just as a beginning, a basic one, I want to talk to you about Ryan Eisler and to clarify a historical misunderstanding from the history of mankind. Rian Eisler, she's an Austrian academic, social activist, and a lawyer, and she's published the spade and the from the goddesses to the gods, from the calyx to the stone. It's it's a must read. It's one of these books that's always been on the first positions of the top ten, and in this work, based on archaeological 
archaeological, historical, and um, genetic evidences, she proves that the great part of our history as species, societies didn't live in a constant battle, fighting, competing, and suffering this male dominance, uh, this image of the prehistoric man with uh, a stake or actually pulling uh, his wife by her mane or her hair. In other words, 95% of the history of mankind, we have been living in peace, in harmony. It is not true that we faced against others and we, we started fighting. It has been scientifically proven that it wasn't the case. We are a mixture of Homo sapiens and the other one, Neanderthal. Neanderthal. It's not the case that Homo sapiens actually killed Neanderthal. They, they actually mixed and, and uh, bred uh, together. So during these, throughout these years of our history, we have lived in the participation and inclusion with each other. And I think this is really nice. We didn't actually stand up in order to hunt with our uh, weapons. No, we wanted to harvest fruits from the trees and the first tools we had were actually baskets in order to um, to stock our fruit and from time to time we actually hunted but basically our food were roots insects vegetables fruits whatever we could harvest and, and pick up in the forest in this participatory and and time of inclusion during uh, centuries, we adored a goddess. And this goddess actually represented creation. Primitive men and women saw that things and, and animals uh, were born, they grew, and they died in a perpetuous cycle, and that the universe created the stars. So logically, for them, creation and this uh, creation goddess was a feminine uh, being and for centuries and centuries women were uh, worshipped. So it's only been a very short period of our history that we are, have been living humiliated by patriarchy. This is the, the beauty of it. It's not the case that we are like this. No, it's not in our nature to be violent and to look for confrontation. 10% of our time as a species, yes, but not 90 or 95 throughout our time. And this, there are thousands of studies. If you're interested, you'll find all the scientific references to other research. For example, burials of uh, caciques or leaders, local leaders. This actually happens once after uh, men and women being settled because bar barbars, barbarians from the north living in deserts, etc. They actually imposed throughout history uh, against the first uh, other chieftains from other settlements. For example, where iron was actually melted, it was used for agricultural tools, never to build uh, the, the, the arrows. It was actually the ones coming afterwards who used the arrows and who imposed the end of uh, the goddess worshiping and who started killing other chieftains and who asked to be buried with a head of a horse with children and, and women also buried with them. So this barbarian uh, attitude, this, this close-mindedness actually caused us uh, to live less, to actually be 10 centimeters shorter. So all this barbarism, um, 
was like this, but now we have archaeologists, female historians, female archaeologists, and with them some men too. They've realized of such uh, situations and such new stories. Up to now, it was always men, the ones painting, the artists, the hunters. What, uh, what did we do during prehistory? Pre Maybe we were hiding under a cabbage. I mean, no. In all prehistoric caves where we have seen uh, fresco paintings, we have realized that it's not the fact that these, um, these men actually had small hands. No, no, they were female. They were women's hands because during prehistory, we actually told stories, we sang songs, we created art, and we only worked 15% of our time when we actually crafted our baskets, we uh, hunt, whatever. <laughs> Sorry, let's stop talking about these fresco paintings. It's, it's really an amazing topic. During these 23 years, I have hundreds of wonderful examples of women who have been able to overcome difficulties, who have not abandoned themselves, who have not said, this is the way things are, there's nothing I can do, and uh, man is a, a wolf for a man. And I could be telling you thousands of stories and amazing lives of everyday life and common women, just normal women who have actually had a single thought and have been able to uh, overcome their difficulties. Let's remember that we have been able to vote just for a few years. We were not allowed to go to universities, even if we wanted. And during the First World War, there were surgeon women, amazing women, who were not accepted. And they just, this happened in London. It was actually the best hospital in London during the First World War. They actually proved that their techniques and this hospital was attended and coordinated 100% by women. They were the ones trans, uh, moving patients. They realized that it took a long time for men to uh, actually bring the patients. So they created their own mobile unit. This pragmatism that is so uh, common in women. So it was a true example. And what happened? It was closed. And after the Second World War, they said, no, 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 women, you cannot access university. That's only for men. Again, the same bloody story. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I need to interview someone else again to understand what is going on. What is the matter, the background problem, apart from habit? I, I don't understand it. It has been proven and it hasn't been published. It hasn't been written. We don't have examples of female artists. I can remember recently, last week, yes, I remember reading that behind a well-known design furniture, furniture, sorry, brand from back in the 70s or 50s, Everything, absolutely, every single member in that company were women. There was one single visible uh, representative who was a man, but the rest were uh, women. I would like to tell you about uh, Stella Carlotto. I don't know if you know her. Stella Carlotto was 
When I met her, she was the president of the grannies, the Plaza de Mayo uh, grandmothers, the ones in Argentina searching for their disappeared uh, grandchildren. This is an NGO founded in 1977 in order to track those missing children during the military dictatorship. They were grandmothers between 65 and almost 80 years old, most of them working at home, housewives, but fed up for uh, the government, nobody doing nothing. So they said, let's get on our skates, let's do something ourselves. And I remember the title of that interview. It read, old as we are, we've managed to put more than one in prison. Yes, they get organized and they go organized, sorry. And Estela Carlotto, I remember when I talked to her, she came and five more, we were in a room, uh, five other grannies. And I remember that Stella was telling her about her daughter being imprisoned and killed. And it was very moving. And the other ones were crying, but I thought, hey, you know the story. But they said, well, every single time it, it really touches it. Of course it does. They would arrive, grandmothers saying, well, yes, my grandson, my granddaughter has also disappeared, but I don't know how to do anything about it. This is also a very, very kind of woman thing to do. What do you mean you don't know? how to do anything. Haven't you been cooking all your life? Yeah, oh, I bake fantastic cakes. Okay, well, you bake the cakes at the meetings. And then other women would go and talk to the military with no nerves whatsoever, without this kind of fashionable thing of, no, I'm so offended, I'll just stand up and leave. No, I mean, this is what our politicians do. I mean, they, they get offended immediately, the drop of a hat, and they, they get up and they leave. Listen, I'm sorry, you can't do that. You're representing me, right? So stay there, stay there and face the music. So what's what's that's what they did. They stayed. Yeah, one cannot just get up and go. And these women never got up and left. They stayed there and they, they fought for what they believed. Another woman I can talk about... Debbie Lerma. Debbie Lerma is the founder of the movement of women in black in Israel, a movement that started to protest against occupation of Israel in the Palestinian territories. And nowadays it's a world peace movement. They fight for peace. Women in hundreds of countries, every Friday, they dress in black and they go and protest because they want peace. Debbie Lerma, I remember, she said to me, all of a sudden I realized, thinking rather crudely, that my son, my son whom I had educated, I had brought him up to be a good person to kind of give his seat on the bus for kind of elderly persons or ladies for him to respect life. They took him to the army and he will come back being a war criminal, she said to me. So he's going to be branded for the rest of his days and nothing will go back to what it was because my son is going to be with other kids like himself, 18, 19 year olds. He's going to kill and they could even kill him, who knows? So his life will be totally destroyed. My son will become a war criminal. And this woman who was a housewife, she said, well, what can I do with this? I mean, I don't want my son to, to do this. What do I do? I go call on the government's door. Nobody will listen to me. She said, well, I'll go and ask my neighbor. What about her? How She's also got a son. I'll go ask her. And the, the neighbor said to her, you're right. So the two went along to another neighbor and another and another and another and once they were quite a substantial group in size, they said, well, in theory, the enemies, what about our enemies? And they went to talk to Palestinian women. And they said, listen, are you happy about them taking your 18 or 19 year old son to take him to fight? Do you agree with this? What's your opinion? And of course, Palestinian women also said, I'd rather have my son at home. I think this is a pointless fight. They shouldn't be fighting. And this is the way that the Women in Black movement was created. 
Israeli and Palestinian women together demonstrating every Friday. In fact, she told me that they held each other because they were, I mean, people would throw eggs, carrots, tomatoes at them, everything. But from 1977 to, to, to date, the movement still exists and it was organized by a housewife. So there you go. I mean, uh, it, it's, you know, one, one has to believe when you face with all these incredible women and not believing them, to me, I think it's people being idiotic, society being stupid. And I'm not talking about men, I insist. I'm talking about kind of the social setting, which is the patriarchy. Taslima Nasrim, Bangladesh. Refugee in, Stoc in Stockholm, raped by her uncle regularly since being a girl and hit every day by her father. This woman started to write. She started writing her story. She started disseminating her story like I do with paper folios written and she gave it to other women. And so then she became gradually being better known and she became, well, she even did uh, with a fatwa. She was sentenced to death. And there were even demonstrations of thousands of men asking that Taslima Nasrin were killed. And she said to me in Sweden, I'm on my own. When, since the day I got to Sweden, I'm on my own. I live on my own with my cat. I'm all alone. Her books are forbidden. They are banned. And they are read in Bangladesh by women in hiding. Also in India, women in hiding. And she said, this makes me feel accompanied. Do you remember Kim Pook? Kim Pook. I'm sure you have the image, all of you. Kim Pook is that famous photograph of a Vietnamese girl who is running naked. She's only nine years old and she's running terrified, yes, in, in, in fire. Okay, well, Kim Pook was uh, made immortal by Nick Wood, who was a North American photographer. Fortunately, this photographer took the picture, but once he took the picture, he also took the girl and took her to a hospital. And as, as total, everybody ignored him and her, he eventually uh, took the girl, took her from one hospital to another. He made sure that she was taken care of and so on and so on and so forth. She, he took her to the States. Then, well, they had to go back to Vietnam. The Communist Party was in power and the Communist Party used Kim Puk as well the, as a flag a flagship against the imperialism and the us and so finally fed up kim Puk was able to flee crossing canada and she left with her husband this woman has uh, been operated on 16 times her body still hurts her skin is still in a mess so shocking a very very hard life once again, the headline was, I hugged the captain that threw the napalm to me. This woman went to a meeting of ex-fighters and military and, well, this general, I can't remember his name, this, this captain, I can't remember his name, was there. And this man, when he saw the photographs of Nikut and he saw this girl and so on, became an alcoholic because he felt really guilty. And in this meeting of ex-military and ex-fighters, he was actually giving a presentation um, saying, well, he felt this guilt and that he drank and, well, he was speaking. And in those moments, Kim Puk had, was there. She was there at the presentation. Nobody had invited her. She went up onto the stage. She looked at the captain and she said, I am that nine-year-old napalm girl. And she hugged him. 
Well, so yeah, incredible women, right? Incredible women. Then what about women scientists? We talked about a couple, but I mean, I'm sure I can't get the name now. Let's see, I forgot. Oh my goodness. Well, never mind. I'll go to another one. When I get the name, I'll go back to this one. So now in the San Sebastian Cinema Festival, we have the film of uh, My Chabel, My Chabel Lassa. And My Chabel Lassa was a representative of what's the name? She directed the movement of the terrorism victims of ETA, the Basque terrorist group in Spain. Her husband, Juan Maria Jauregui, who was the ex-civil governor of Guipúzcoa, was uh, killed by ETA. I interviewed my child in 2015, but her husband had uh, fled the country because ETA had threatened him and so he'd left. He was living abroad. But he went back for the birthday, the 18th birthday of his daughter, and there in a bar he was murdered, he was killed. My Chabel, what, what did she do? Well, My Chabel knew, among other things, that her husband was a man who had always uh, fought for the fact, despite the fact that the war because, I mean, well, the conflict would be a better name, not really war, yes. The, the conflict with ETA was uh, going through bad times and he always wanted dialogue. He always believed in negotiation, in compromising. He didn't believe in violence and weapons. And my child, his wife, she followed in her husband's footsteps after he was killed. And she was the person fighting for those restorative meetings. That's the way they were called. It means meetings of victims and ETA people. And my Chabel, I believe, was not the first, but really the only one who, yes, indeed, met. Because her, her husband, I mean, was killed by a group of three people. And she met two of them, of that group of three. One officially, because that's when these uh, restorative meetings started. I mean, there was, as you know, a group of ETA people who already felt bad about what they'd been doing. And they couldn't justify what they'd done. And they decided to seek forgiveness. Amongst them was one of the ones that killed her husband. Well, she, she met with, with one and another, both, and obviously she, well, they didn't really talk about politics, but rather they talked from the heart and she asked them all, she said, why, why, why do you do this? Why kill? And they said to her, well, we receive an order, a command, we are soldiers and we do what we told to do. But of course, they had, these men had already changed, yes. And the headline for the interview is, I always believed in second chances. But of course, can you see what an incredible, what an admirable ability, or I don't know, maybe women, and I don't know if this will be the case forever, but up till now, Maybe because we have been kind of living more in inside worlds because of social pressure, yes. We women could not really go out of our homes so easily. We were not allowed in taverns. We couldn't vote. We had to be at home and so on and so forth. I mean, this happened at the beginning of the 20th century. It's not, it didn't happen all that long ago, yeah? I mean, it's still happening too. But anyway, it's not something in the past. But maybe because we've been in this interior world, this is the way we are. And there is a greater vision from inside and that uh, makes us or allows us to take maybe different, uh, more encompassing standpoints. But I have already always believed in second chances. This is what Mabel Ma told me. Before I was telling you, I wanted to talk about scientist women. Lynn Margulies, Lynn Margulies showed that 
cells. The first cells, the, 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 first, the very first cells evolved because they cooperated with each other. They wouldn't, you know, eat each other up, on, 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 which is a bit the, the, the story that we have been hearing and telling for so long. But life is not that. It's not eating up the other. It's not killing the other. It's cooperation. And Lynn Margulis said this exactly. She said, listen, you all wrong. Cells started cooperating and they started coming together. They didn't start eating each other up because nothing would exist. Cells started cooperating and then life began thanks to the cooperation of cells and we make headway and we evolve thanks to cooperation. Well, listen, Lynn Margulies, she was very, very funny, had a great sense of humor. I remember when I interviewed her, uh, I, I said, well, I'm sure that you defended a theory that's mm, kind of you were the only person to defend this theory, I said to her. And let me tell you, finally, she was able to prove it scientifically. And I said to her, how have your colleagues reacted to your success? When I'm I go on for too long, let me know. No, I've tried to be very discreet. But Ima, we're not doing very well about time at all. So, mm, well, I mean, try to end if possible. Yes, yes, I will, I will. Yeah, we're 15 minutes late, I'm afraid. Gosh, I'm so sorry, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, the audience, I mean, this is normal. It happens, you know, with so many things to say. I have more and more. I could tell you much more. Anyway, what, I, what I'm trying to say, this is an anecdote. I said to her, to Lynn Margulis, I said, I guess that defending this theory of cooperation against the scientific uh, status quo, yes, and that has this idea of permanent war and fighting has gone against you. And she said, listen, I have been in scientific conferences explaining my theory and a scientist man colleague has stood up to say to me, why don't you go home and do the washing? And this is what she said, but we're still living in this kind of world. Obviously, there are men that are not this way, but there are men who are. And we live in a world in which we are missing out. I mean, half the population is missing out and this has to change. It has to change. And in fact, there is more and more evidence as to the fact that there's another way to live. Before I was telling you about, about these uh, anthropological discoveries, right? I mean, the way we see life and the world is so important. That woman, I can't remember her name. I gave it you before, yeah? The one of goddesses, yes. Anyway, she was saying to me that anthropologists would find just about everywhere little figures of women shapes with a huge vulva. And those were the figures of the goddesses. And what did the anthropologists who found these figures call them? Prehistoric sexual toys. Come on, all the frescoes and all the frescoes, you see symbols that they define as non-determined signs and symbols. Still women archeologists and women, women anthropologists came along and said, no, no, these are not just non-specific symbols. These are vaginas. Finally, and I promise I, I, I'll finish. I mean, I have so many things to tell you, but I'll, I'll end it here. Just one. Let me mention a woman. Let me find her. Who, her name is, where do I have her? Wait a minute. Yes. Oh, where is she? Where is she? Well, Annabella. Yeah. Annabella is a woman who suffered because her husband would hit her. She had problems, it was shocking. And right now she's a woman who's been awarded many, many prizes. And um, she created a kind of tenderness network because what she said is women who are victims of abuse need to be welcomed into a network of sorority. And what she did was create a women's network that welcomed uh, women victims of abuse. Yeah, so they would help each other. They would take these women to their homes and look after them. And this woman, Ana Vela, said, if one out of every three women is a victim of abuse in the world, 
The idea is not to say poor things, but rather that one of every three men is crazy and he hates, humiliates and abuses a person he says he loves. We have to change the focus, that is. We have to move on from all this uh, victimism and we have to go on to acknowledgement and action. Okay, that's all, thank you. Thank you very much, Ima. I would like to remind you and our public, our participants, that at the end we will have a Q&A session. So you will also have the chance of answering to uh, or, or adding some other interesting story. Righty, now we will enjoy a short 15 minute long pause, but before that, I will introduce you to Ainara Garcia, who's a wonderful artist. I would like her to introduce herself because I don't want to uh, say anything wrong. We will uh, give her the floor. Right. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. The truth is that it's amazing listening to Imma and the wonderful stories that she's told us. I write poetry, I do slam, the spoken word uh, competition events, uh, this is what slam means, and today I have a few poems for you, this is what I do, and a few reflections come with them. I would like to start with another one, but Imma reminded me all that, uh, thanks to what she said, one called, a poem called My Little Girl, which talks about this space uh, where the women uh, have been recluded, the only potential, on, only, the only possible place where she's recluded as a slave or as a muse. It also talks about my grandma, who was a lady who would have been able to do whatever she wanted in life. She loved art and music, but she was, as all of them, a housewife. In the afternoon, I used to go there one afternoon, and one of them, one of the last times I actually saw her, she reached by my ear and she told me, my little girl, let me and give me your pearl fingers on my lap. I can't stand any else, anything else but a flower. Hurry up, for my face is worn out and time is withering at its roots. Sit next to this body, ground down by the years, this body that permeates home and oozes confinement. And Look at me, light up these black ear, these black eyes, leave the paintings and listen to me, my child. I know you want to be an artist, but haven't you seen your grandmother's sad hands, her chest swollen by the rain, the wrinkles on her neck and her chains, my child. If my heart is already a clay Christ and my only work is this house and those who walked on it, let your mother of pearl fingers fall, that we were always the muse like so many others who cried. My body was naked before your eyes, a painting, and for centuries they've made of this skin pose, fruit, and damage. They also sculpted my kisses and my embraces. I was the end of the chisel, dust of tin. I was still before so many eyes, silent before so many frames, who had me for a muse as the only trade and almost dead when I didn't try. I was the verse and not the signature. I was the voice and not the artist. I was the brush stroke.
took the word and the edge. They sang to me, they wrote to me, they sculpted me and even cried for me. The brush was exchanged for the scoring part. My voice was forced to be a lullaby and to my arms the care. My child, don't you see that this house has a sad murmur of broken dreams, that I don't have these calluses for love nor this wound that this will is not mine, that if I would like to be painting the white fall of your caress, but out there, the world always cries out another song. My child, I don't want you, I don't want you to die like me and so many others who cried. That day, I gave up painting and I didn't know what else to say, but a couple of years afterwards, I could then tell her, Grandma, now that I've grown up, I could tell you that we were not, not all of us cried, we were not always the muse, maybe the earth has, uh, they were artists like you, because I saw in your eyes the pain of Silvia Virginia, I've touched uh, the, 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 the impressionistic color of Cassad. I've seen your sculpt and embrace like Camille, raise the spider like Louis and whisper like we choked for Chavela. You recited me like Gloria and I carry her lullaby almost to sleep. You've made the routine a daily basement like Anna and you've been silent like Marilyn. I know that you've imagined so many films like Agnes, Lucrecia or Alice to find in a vision the strength and not the rope. I remember you and I cry like Storni and I almost scream like Lola because I've seen you move with the rage of a Maya until the last years they cradled you like so many others did because we weren't always muses grandma nor did we always cry they were artists as you were grandma as you were as i will be when you finally see me by your side thank you thank you very much Okay, let's enjoy a 10 minute break. Thank you.
Buenas tardes de nuevo. Buenos días. Volvemos con la Good afternoon once again. Hi, we're now going on to the second part of the presentations. We have with us now Alicia Oliver Rojo. I would like to apologize publicly because uh, we have a mistake in the agenda. We wrote Rojo and it's Rojo. Alicia is responsible for the work group on solidarity and journalism of the Professional Association of Journalists and a founding member of the Association of Women Journalists in Catalonia and of the European Network of Journalist Women and also the International Network Gender Conditions. So welcome, Alicia, and you have the floor. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, first of all, I would like to say thanks twice over. First, thank you to the organizers for having invited me and also because you selected a topic which uh, we really think is basic. There is so much work to be done in the media. Headway has been made if we look back, but in any case, there's a long way to go. So please, could you give me my presentation on the screen? Perfect, lovely. Well, listen, I'm, as Milanka was saying, I'm a member of the European Network of Women Journalists, and we carried out a study with our colleagues from the Association of Feminist Journalism, who published a feminist uh, newspaper, and we carried out a study um, that, uh, well, received some help from the Labour Department, from the Family Department and the Social Affairs Department of the Catalan government. What the study wanted to do, its goal was to see whether the Catalan media were in fact incorporating all the topics and subjects that have to do with media that follow the state agreement and the action platform of the Beijing Summit recommendations. And the study had four stages. I'll explain them as I go along. The first was documentary review. And in this stage of our work, a number of colleagues from the feminist newspaper that are more specialized in, in such a follow-up of this state agreement. And what we did was uh, to actually review and follow the guidelines in chapter J of the action, the platform for action of Beijing. I mean, 26 years have gone by, but that uh, platform for action is still considered the seminal document that has these 12 areas of action that the governments, the different states have to apply in order to eventually get to something that is such a dream of ours, which is equality or gender equality. And the chapter J, the 12 topics didn't have numbers from one to 12, but they were letters and J was if I remember correctly, for women and dissemination. That was the name of the chapter uh, of the summit uh, of Beijing. I should say as well that in 1995, um, and I believe today would not be feasible, but then the, this was uh, passed by the unanimity of all the countries attending this fourth summit in Beijing, uh, United Nations summit. And truthfully, I mean, that was 170 countries, no less. Nowadays, this just wouldn't be feasible. It wouldn't happen because we see, don't we, the Vatican, Nicaragua, Iran, and other countries that are really trying to go back and, and just not work on subjects that were mentioned already in 1995. On the basis of this review, what we did was carry out a series of surveys and interviews and we sent 100 surveys to journalists in Catalonia. And of these, we, well, 70 were sent back to us, 70 were answered. So the percentage is not bad. We're pretty happy 70% of the journalists answered. First, we want to see the profile of the people who had actually answered the survey. And I think you see it. Uh, numbers, of course, uh, I don't really remember, but here you have it. Of those 
it's just a small sample, of course, obviously, but really um, this is, it gives us a lot of information. 84% of those who responded, of course, were sent by women journalists as to age, well, most from 31 to 65, 69% working actively. And as to the journalists, well, essentially they came from communication cabinets, from private and public media. Then something else that we wanted to know about, the second block of the survey had to do with training and education. So what was the training and education of these people? And when we asked them many, many questions, but here I'm just bringing, well, some of them a selection because if not, we won't have time, of course. One of the questions was whether they knew measures that had to do with uh, media in uh, the Spanish agreement against gender violence and 45% said that they didn't know about this agreement of the Spanish government. We asked about the Istanbul Covenant and about the definition of violence in this uh, Istanbul Covenant and 58% did not know what this definition of violence was. And we also asked them whether the company or the medium in which they worked had offered training, specific training about um, male chauvinist violence. Well, once again, more than half, 54% said that the medium were in which they worked or the company that they worked in had not given them any training at all. The question we asked them about training was whether the, um, the company or the medium had trained them about sexual direct sexual harassment or uh, second degree sexual abuse the one that now fortunately yes is part of the current catalan law against violence yeah which is that violence that is exerted against the people who give support those persons who are suffering violence so here well 58% did not have specific training as to this. We also asked about whether the medium or the company had given them any kind of materials, a manual, a style manual or recommendations, of course, because they do exist. And truth be told, there are quite a few, but maybe they don't get to where they should get to. And well, here, yet again, more than 60% said that their medium or the company that they worked for had not given them any manual, any guidelines, any recommendations about being able to improve the news that have to do with male chauvinist violence. We've seen that in the companies of that small sample, I insist, only 70 answers of the survey that came to us. Well, practically, we saw that training was not being given. We asked them as well whether they, as journalists, out of working hours, had attended training courses, whether they were interested. And here, yes, we do see an interest because 52% had, in fact, uh, gone attended a course about how to use or how to deal or how to improve, better said, the, the way news are dealt with when they have to do with male chauvinist violence. And yes, well, they had decided to attend courses out of the environment of their jobs. They had done it as private individuals. A third block, professional practice. We wanted to know, and we asked them this way. We asked them whether they knew about cases justifying or trivializing Mm, male chauvinist violence. It's a bit what mm, Alicia was telling us about in her first presentation, yeah, the one about advertising. And here they answered uh, mostly 52% new of quite a few cases. Yes. Another important problem that eventually is getting better, but not as good as it should be, or at least things are not being, be, being done the way they should. Another problem we encountered is yet another question that we asked was whether they knew cases of news in which the victim had been put in doubt. So the typical girl going back home at three o'clock in the morning is raped 
and yeah, and then the comment is, well, yes, why were why were you working on your own at three o'clock in the morning? Yeah. So news like these, mm, thank goodness, uh, while well, they're going down, but we still see some. We still see some. Yeah, where yeah, people say, oh, she was drunk, she was wearing a mini skirt, or sentences, of course. I mean, of judges, uh, not all that long ago. Yeah. So here, yes, uh, well, they replied. 58% said yes, they did know about cases in which the victim had been kind of made to appear guilty and nearly 40% said quite a few. Then also we asked about cases in which the aggressor had been justified. Yeah, when they say, no, he was so in, so much in love with her or he was drunk, he was drugged, he didn't know what he was doing. It was just a frenzy. There are still, we still read news in which there is a certain justification of male chauvinist uh, violence. And yes, a high percentage, 54% said they knew about such cases. And finally, the fourth block of the interview that had to do with the action and prevention protocol against direct and secondary sexual harassment mm, linked to journalism. Well, here, among the questions that we posed, one was whether their medium or their company had any specific action and prevention protocol. 39% said they didn't know, they did not know. So there's quite an important lack of knowledge. I mean, never mind the companies or media having that or not. 30% said yes, another 30% said no, they didn't have it. But there is a huge mass of journalist colleagues that don't know about this, whether there is an action protocol. And in the case of its existing, the question was, was it effective as an action and prevention protocol? 63% said they didn't know because there's no follow-up. In fact, there is no assessment of whether it is being effective. There's no information. And with this last question, that was the end of this blog. And well, we asked, it was an open-ended question as to what improvements would they put forward to, to get the situation better. And these are the, the five recommendations that most coincided on. For example, in those media or companies that didn't have a protocol, obviously there had to be a protocol prepared and disseminated among the workers and obviously make it uh, something that has to be complied with. Then when there is uh, uh, somebody denouncing the protocol has to be activated immediately. Training, training um, right from the beginning at the faculties of journalism at the university in the compulsory subjects. Because I mean, yes, sometimes you have an optional subject dealing with this, but what they wanted was that all students learned this at the journalism faculty. And then also um, the possibility of implementing measures to punish those companies or media not complying with the, the ethical codes or even complying with the law. Yes, in the cases of male chauvinist violence. The third stage of the study was face-to-face uh, -face interviews. We carried out 10, two persons uh, with responsibility jobs in different media, persons who have the responsibility and the ability to change and decision-making power, so to speak, yes, for things to happen, for training courses to be given, protocols to be written and signed and so on. And these are the three coincidences that we detected, yes, that they themselves explained. There is no follow-up mechanism to see whether the media are applying action protocols they also stated that there are some recommendations, some recommendations and trainings in the company, but what didn't seem to exist was the assessment of the impact of all this on the professional action of people. What was missing was the assessment to see whether these actions and recommendations were in fact useful to improve the way journalists treated or dealt with this topic. And they also talked about rectification mechanisms that were not well defined. Finally, in the last part of the study, well, it was quite an interesting discussion flow. I hope that we could have that more often because truly, I remember we did this in the Professional Journalists Association. We got 10 
people together, half of them journalists and the other half were representatives of different associations and organizations of women, expert in, in gender violence. And I'm saying interesting, but it's a way of, well, because of listening to each other. If we want to improve the way we communicate, we have to listen very well as journalists, because of course it's women who are victims, who are the experts, they are living these situations. So then they are the ones that can help us. And what we did in this meeting, well, once again, uh, what came up is this about compulsory education, establishing follow-up mechanisms, assessing the impact of the measures and guidelines deployed. And they also would ask the, the journalists in this case, they asked us to support victims and not re-victimize where their words, yes, after having gone through terrible times well, the, the communication media medium sometimes re-victimize them. And well, because uh, they, that would be a problem and maybe it would give false ideas. And this is not something that only mass, I mean, it's not only the mass media, yeah? I mean, all the legal action professionals are also working on victimizing too. Something else is that we go back to specific training, very important in newsrooms to incorporate the role of gender edition and to establish uh, advisory boards, other independent from the media where there could be, well, an, a possibility to influence. This is what they said. I see Milanka is over there. Do I have time still? We have three projects I wanted to tell you about very, very quickly. Five minutes? Okay, lovely. Let's see if I, if I achieve this. So another project in which we have participated that's very interesting is the one of uh, the world monitoring of media. I don't know whether you know it. This is a study that is taking place and here I'm giving you 2020 data. I took slides out of my presentation. 15 minutes is a very short time. So this is a simultaneous study. It was started in 1995 as a response to that J chapter I mentioned of the Action Beijing platform. So that was something on which a lot of work had to be done because uh, whether we like it or not, the media, or mass media, well, and I'm not going to go to it again, but of course we do create the social imaginary and it's not the same to be than not to be in this case. And so we realized that yes, we had to go to focus on these topics. It is in every five years and it's an X-ray. The most extensive and important study carried out in the world about gender in the, in the media. And this gives a snapshot, a snapshot of the representation of men and women in the media, the way they are represented. This snapshot was done for the first time in Spain and well, from the Association of Women Journalists linked to the Autonomous University of Madrid between 2005 and 2010. And then in 2015, Elvira Altes, who was a coordinator, she retired. And so then came Nuria Sibelio. Now in 2020, it's being carried out by Teresa Mira of the university. The study then in the Spanish state and all over the world means, well, you select the same day for everyone and there's high levels of secrecy, quite incredible because up to the week before, we don't know what day it's going to be. And this to try and make sure that it's a normal day in inverted commas and that we can study and analyze well. The study took place on September 29th, 2020. 563 informations were gathered of 32 media and mean, means of the Spanish state. And now, yes, I'll be quick, quick. What I wanted to say here, I have a PowerPoint and every five years uh, I update it. Yes. So here I may, I wanted to maintain the figures of 20, uh, to and compare with 2015. In press, radio and television, women represent women shown in the news and in press, radio, TV, and also in social networks, Twitter and online press. Well, women 
in 2010 were 23%. We went up to 28% in 2015. And now in 2020, the report is uh, ending. I mean, we've, we've got it, it's just recently published. Uh, I think 116 countries, each one codes, uh, each one of the coordinators in their country. And then this is sent to the central headquarters, which is, well, they have two, which is this NGO in London and also in Canada. It means to gather and gather all those figures. It's pretty difficult to do something like this. That's why it wasn't in July. Yes, the presentation proper to all the countries. In the Spanish case, we lowered it. We lowered the price at 2%. I believe it might not be a lot. Of course, it's not a lot, but as we were already uh, flagging, it's a lot. In digital press and Twitter, we have, well, women are slightly more represented, 31%. We lost two points since 2015. And now we below the European average because in 2015, we were over this European level. More interesting and important data. Well, this is uh, what's negative this year, but here we have an important item and it will have to be included definitely in quarantine, I don't know. But it's the last section and it has to do with, uh, well, women as uh, sources of information. In 2015, there were 9%, 9% only of women they would have an opinion and they were considered experts in some subject area in 2015. Whereas this year, it's rather surprising because we moved from nine to 34%. Why? Well, obviously one of the things that should be done is that we are in a context of pandemic, right? Still there. So the training and request of opinion and what have you has been done more among the 74% and essentially people with problems uh, in, um, but also about what is more feminized, not the, um, the top people, I mean the board. I remember when I started being a journalist, I was very surprised to see the nursing school uh, in Barcelona and it was all women nurses and the president was a man. I remember that, or oh, at the schools. Yeah, I mean, the PTAs, uh, the PTA of my kids was essentially 80%. It was te women teachers, whereas the director, the principal and the secretary would be the only two male teachers of the school. Having said this then, the challenges for the coming five years years for this uh, quinquennial period, because in 2025, this x-ray will be taken again. Well, it's, it's the same too. It carries out gender standpoint. It wants to incorporate as well the publishing houses and also editors. And well, to this, we add the uh, equality focus, definitely. Uh, based on diversity and having to do with the intersectionality and the use of inclusive language. I won't say what, uh, what institution, but yesterday precisely in an international webinar, and let me come to an end, of women journalists, the presenter was talking in masculine all the time. And on Zoom, you can see the people. I mean, there were 70 odd people, only three men. And the presenters was always speaking in the masculine all the time instead of using the generic feminine form. And furthermore, it was a women journalist association. I mean, I was really quite shocked and quite and put out about it. Some people say it's anecdotal. I don't think it's anecdotal at all. I think the one has to be very, very careful with this. And truly, if we are not spoken about, we don't exist. Anyway, this is my final slide, which has to do with making headway in gender equality and rights of women in communication and journalism. This is uh, we uh, what we've published. We're presenting it next week on the 29th. It's, uh, well, a uh, decalogue uh, about recommendations and guidelines that has been written by journalists of six countries belonging to, to the world, Chile, Argentina, Colombia, Mexico, Brazil, 
and the Catalan uh, journalists we hear, yes, as well. And this has to do with different topics that are related to the, the means. And then we were talking about violences against uh, journalists, women professionals of communication. And that is all. I've been very quick. I'm so sorry there wasn't all that much time, but I've been very good about time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alicia, our eternal enemies time. It's been wonderful. Uh, but yes, uh, today we still have much, a lot, a lot of uh, a long path still to walk. Gemma Ruiz Pala is our next speaker, so you're welcome to come here and choose your seats. Yes, you can remove your mask. She's a director of the editor-in-chief of the TV uh, Free News Services. Before editora jefe, it's a, a male noun in Spanish, whether it's a, a female or a man or a woman. As our previous speaker said, uh, uh, welcome Gemma, she'll be talking to us about this and a lot of more things. Thank you very much, Milanka. When we uh, got in touch first, uh, she told me, how is that I'm occupying this uh, seat today here? Thank you very much. Before further ado, these sessions are very important. Uh, male violence attacks thousands, actually half of the world's population in more or, or a lesser degree, and it's not considered as a fundamentals right attack as it should be. So having devoted sessions for this, it's very important. So thank you. Thank you for your invitation today and for welcoming me to share uh, something about our work. Milenka asked me how is that I started uh, being a journalist for over 20 years. I've devoted my work to the cultural services for the Catalan CV, Catalan CV. And I'll let you know a little bit about my career. I devoted my work to the cultural news and I came back from uh, special leave that I took to do some research for a future novel. And when I came back, the director of the news asked me to be uh, editor in chief. And I actually started laughing because being a woman, uh, relatively young, coming from the cultural uh, section of the news, it's not the typical place where you can actually jump and improve your, your status to become editor-in-chief. And actually the, the sort of excuse was that uh, traditionally there were older men coming from international or the politics sessions, probably uh, women journalists uh, are used to, to such uh, typical positions, but not only they wanted to change a profile, but they wanted to sort of use my everyday life battle uh, in my team, uh, usually I'm quite stubborn to write, so I was learning on feminist issues in order to write uh, my novels. And without asking for permission, I was actually sharing, you know, uh, complaining, pointing my finger, this is a sexist use of an image, or warning about the uh, sexist use of the language. So. Uh, usually people like each other, you know, in a, in a journalist team. So I've always been quite clear, you know, with all my female and male colleagues. So they wanted to use this sort of energy that I had created and asked me not only to become the editor-in-chief, but also the one suggesting a uh, gender perspective training always in in petit comité you know in small teams i'd always defended and asked uh, for so i actually jumped on my skates i asked uh, someone who's who was an expert this has been really worked and researched but there's this sort of individual sorry invisible barrier that impedes the, the actual information coming to the people who's who's looking for that information so i i, I met this other girl who had worked and 
this colleague actually had worked in the media, in, in the newspapers, it's actually more complex. So these are the girl, this Arancha Diez, who had written a document. She had researched for one whole year, actually supported by the School of uh, Journalists here, by the ICD, etc. It was um, text on recommendations to introduce um, non-male uh, violence language in the media. So we established, we organized this training and we wanted me not to have the only gender position. I was the editor-in-chief. There are three other people who are two men and one more woman. And our strategy after uh, thinking about it for a long time, we wanted it to be fully in integral, thorough, and it was compulsory for the whole uh, journalist team and we covered every single position two or three afternoons every week uh, we bombarded them non-stop we saw funny faces and some resistances we could write a novel about it but how could i say it was a wonderful taste of that uh, position you know uh, starting my newly uh, position by doing that i've really enjoyed it to be honest with you so first of all we trained the top levels and then uh, the rest of positions, uh, the rest of the teams, with a commitment that the editor-in-chief and the other male editor-in-chiefs, we would become two gender, but the department responsible or department heads should also be surveilling the whole process. It's a sort of insistence, little by little, being it's ant work, you know. We obviously wanted to shoot our Kalashnikovs, uh, but being patient, resilient, and being convinced of our goal, being assertive too, because we had to say, hey, let's do this this way without humiliating others. This is the situation we're in. And also when we deal with male uh, violence forms, it's nothing, right now it has nothing to do with the past. This base document, as Alicia mentioned, we had some title examples and we thought, no, 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 let's talk about it amongst ourselves because it's easy to pinpoint at someone else's title at another newspaper, but no, let's be self-critical. If it doesn't hurt, it doesn't cure you. So we trained everyone. And also I must admit that our style manual, basically everything that we started establishing, what happens is that in general, uh, our, our newspaper is a public uh, company. It's a, a very thick manual. Nobody actually reads it just punctually. So occasionally, so we said, Right. At the beginning, we were thinking of a protocol, but, you know, being strict, it's just to be used uh, when uh, in case of an emergency. So we want it to be a short document. People actually don't read over three pages. So this document uh, was actually useful and it's worked. Now we are working uh, in a really nice manner, for example, um, this Decalogue, I'll give you a few examples of it. The concept of uh, male, vi male violence. Secondly, we use gender violence, but it's forbidden. Of course, purists could come and say, no, you cannot forbid things or specific terms. We don't recommend, let's say, domestic violence. No, we don't use that from our pieces of information because they recall this systemic, uh, it doesn't have, uh, the, the personal becomes uh, politic as we know. So we defined briefly, male violence is any aggression, any form of aggression from a man with a woman, in, irrespectively of their relationship, because it doesn't really matter whether they're in a love relationship. Let's remember the Mossos, the, the police are still linking this piece of data and some homicides actually don't specify because there's no, as I say, this sort of relationship. And sexual violence, as, as we understand, comes within the same, uh, this same case. Another issue that was hard to change was to 
make everyone understand that this is not um, sort of leisure, non-important section of our news. No, it's not. Uh, uh, it's not an events sort of article. So we removed it from that uh, blog. And it, an events, it's something that's uh, happening and it's systemic and it's happening over and over again. It's fortuitous. So this was quite hard to, you know, before the door of the killing, we wanted to film it live. No, it was quite hard to understand uh, people keep thinking that it, it's an image and, and we seem to be censoring the image but we debated it we talked it and we said no this is not censorship we are defending good journalism so in the end this uh, decalogue is basically doing a work properly as a public enterprise we need to do it even even better We'll always find resistances. Talking about survivor and not victim, especially when we're interviewing uh, victims of uh, male uh, violences, never publicizing the, the, the address, the victim's address for respect to this person and uh, her family. We should never film the facade, the facade of the building. We should never add any more bows. Uh, we can see the beheaded lady in Reus, for example. We will never, um, we should never uh, disseminate such information. No, um, this sort of uh, personal detailed and morbidity is forbidden. I hope you can understand me. I'm quite fast. We feel quite lonely because the Valencian TV Punt, they also share this protocol which impedes, which doesn't allow them to go to the victim's facade. But any other local TVs, they don't have any sort of good practice. Uh, and all over the world, actually, it's quite a tricky situation too. A few years ago, I was interviewed by a public Swedish TV company. And it's quite um, specific. There are not many media companies. Generally speaking, there are some sort of general um, tips that are not always followed or respected. You really need loads of, you know, um, energy because in my case, it's been decades of actually seeing we're part of the of the system. We've been sort of uh, being bombarded with, with all these forms of violence. So if media also helped and actually understood and accepted such recommendations, we wouldn't see these, all this information, this morbidity, uh, details, re-victimizing and re-watching, re-showing all these images that fiction has been uh, never-endingly bombarding us with, you know. So if we all respect that, our action would actually be replicated properly. Also, the previous colleague said we should not uh, talk about the presence of alcohol or drugs if it hasn't been part of the strategy, the aggression strategy. It's again the same stereotype, drugs, alcohol, the miniskirt and uh, the disco. Again, always victimizing and considering uh, the girls uh, guilty. Again, asking witnesses, asking neighbors, oh, well, he seemed to be a nice guy, you know, and again, it's this Im imaginary of, oh, well, he's a monster. No, it could be your dad, your neighbor, the local baker, you know. These testimonies are useless. Actually, on the contrary, they, they, they deduct the information, uh, sorry, the importance of, of uh, the fact, the anonymity of people involved should be respected. Again, never film victims of prostitution, forced prostitution, unless they want to denounce it. Because when we film people who are victims of uh, human trafficking or prostitution, we should always respect their, their identity. Again, this is interwoven uh, male chauvinism and racism. We should not 
uh, highlight cases of male uh, violence with specific cultural or ethnographic uh, groups of society. One of the xenophobic, racist Vox, the right wing political party, is that the profile of the raper is has the face of a member of the this mana, this this manada this this um, gang uh, group violating a girl. No, no, he's not black. He's white, and he is a Spaniard. He has a Spanish ID. Uh, again, previous denounced cases. It's important to remember there was no previous denounce. No, this doesn't help. This actually um, pinpoints um, the lady. We should always consider the denounced cases that have been filed in context. We should never blame the women because in Spain, sorry, in, in Catalonia, all these um, uh, these cases filed, um, I specifically talk about the notifications of uh, these, these reports should not be just talked about because um, filed cases are useful, but it depends on every specific case. Right, so we have explained what lies behind the case of report, you know, a report being filed. Again, making fiscal, political, public policies. I mean that when we keep minutes of silence, uh, every single town hall uh, person saying we denounce, blah, 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 we said no, we don't agree. We should always ask any town major or town hall representative what sort of resources what sort of resources, I repeat, that your municipality or local city is implementing for this? Do you have a budget? What is it? Where is your office? Where can you go? All this created or generated their rejection to get back to us, but actually afterwards they created a plan or a framework and they had a minimal budget to create um, some sort of gender policy. So this fourth power, well, sometimes uh, we do, if we do our work properly, uh, at the end of the day, people do listen to you. Um, also, we've reported uh, all about um, demonstrations against, because we forget about the image of the crime and the blood and everything, but obviously we need to illustrate the story with something. Uh, otherwise, our editors are going to say, well, this is television. Okay, we're going to show some demonstrations and some min minutes of silence. What else? Reinforcing with contents that actually put in context this vul vulneration of uh, human rights. And also, something we do is to add a uh, label or banner actually burned on the screen with the telephone, the 900, 900, 910 in the case of Catalonia, so that victims and aggressors actually watch the news and they can see this phone. So it's, it's creating, building awareness. So again, we always talk about the sort of, uh, these aggressors are watching the news, as I said. So um, it's interesting if we talk about sentences, you know, uh, with a judge, for example, uh, dealing with such cases, we never forget to express, to, to inform rather about the myriad of possibilities of the sentences. Am I forgetting something? Uh, right, yeah. Um, regarding what the previous speaker said, we actually wanted to be audited to make sure we're complying with this uh, list. Uh, we have this agreement with the University Autonoma. They have um, a, a project uh, of at, at the end of the studies, the four-year studies, and as a tutor of one of these projects, this, uh, this, this follow-up project, I was asked for certain topics and I said, I would like to be audited on how we deal with uh, male violence and 
what our situation is regarding gender perspective. So a year ago, with regards to male violence, it was great. We were not re-victimizing, we were not showing uh, blood. But with regards to gender perspective, we still have a lot to do because a, a, a detail, for example, women always have a name and surname. And um, this was something that uh, maybe it's a little it's too objective to say uh, our colleagues to do it, but there are some other details that it's more difficult to improve. But uh, anyway, it's it's the self criticism, this recognition of the things we need to improve. Uh, it's it, it's important. Our weaknesses, you know, it's it's. Uh, with regards to male violence, it's easier, it's more technical, it's easier to implement things. So we've done a huge leap uh, towards improvement. I guess the key is to have uh, girls, women in roles of uh, uh, power positions. Uh, with regards to abortion, for example, we believe it's vital because when you look back at uh, previous stories, you understand that it's a radical change when it comes to the ones driving and making decisions and to decide which topics are to be chosen or not. When you realize that women are in positions of power, then you don't actually need to apply any sort of gender perspective. So I hope my uh, speech has been useful. If you would like to contact us to share our tools, please do get in touch with us. It's an internal document, but we'd really like to, to share it with you. And thank you very much for listening to me. Cheers. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gemma. Thank you to all of you uh, to this afternoon session. And unfortunately, we're running out of time. Uh, well, in theory, now we should start our debate. We have a lot of questions for the three of you. Uh, and uh, congratulations to Ainara. So, I, uh, Mark, we will try to answer everyone. You will see on the screen right now an email where you can send us your questions. I will send them to our speakers and we will answer them via email. Don't you worry because we will make sure that they will be all answered. It's quite unfortunate because we need to finish on time and also we should be respectful with our participants. I would like to uh, finish with another poem by Ainara so that we go back home with uh, a nice memory. I think we could, we could continue talking for hours and hours, but let's remember tomorrow we'll be back here at 4 p.m. And please do send your queries, questions, comments, observations, whatever you like, uh, via chat or email. And see you back tomorrow at 4. We'll be here. Thank you all. Thank you. Ahora, vale. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to be closing today's session, so I won't add much to what's been said. Only let me tell you that this last poem I'm going to be reading to you or saying reflects on gender stereotypes, and I compare them with a bottle of wine, okay? And so then you'll wonder, what has gender got to do with a bottle of wine? Let us start with the bottle, the bottle, common noun, feminine gender. She, with the capacity to store any kind of liquid, any data, no matter how small. She, so sentimental that when it is emptied, bent down, she cries drop by drop her misfortune. She, the bottle with a subtle, correct, cautious way, she tries not to go beyond the limits that the table imposes on her so as not to break, because she is so fragile, they say, so delicate. 
she sinks her glassy sides around the brittle waist of an opening that connects the outside with the inside, an opening through which penetrates like a defoliated rose, the wine of the blood alcohol. The alcohol, common noun, masculine gender in Spanish. Alcohol runs away from commitments as soon as it enters the bottle, as soon as it comes in, it goes out. He within a physical capacity to make throats burn. He who is born of the violet and tender grape becomes an ecstatic and crimson chemistry that fills the body with courage and the veins with lovers. He is impetuous, nocturnal. He is the color of blood. He is the important one. He gives meaning to the bottle because without him, there is no sorrow to drown in. And so before entering the discotheque in the stillness of the night, broken by a couple of drunken voices engrossed in the small grass, glassy tsunami of alcohol that occurs when the bottle hits the floor after each swig in different self-absorbed amidst the alcoholic air of a park. And so you learn some of the gender roles hidden in a bottle of wine. You get frustrated, you tear yourself apart. You get angry because you're fed up and drunk with so much stereotyping. And then you want to throw the bottle of wine against all the bodies and let the soggy glasses stick in their pupils and weep the blood of squeezed grapes and realize that there is no gender role written on their saliva that they have been bound influenced delineated inebriated intoxicated alcoholized by a bottle of wine thank you so much <laughs>